Cheers. Um, I think we'll talk about um, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, uh -huh. um, which was an earlier book before um, before this one, um, because it was about the first female historian of the American Revolution, and um, that that was an exciting book because not an awful lot has been written about her. Right. Right. She was she was important. Um, I've written a lot of other books, but my focus is on women in history. And I always start with a question. Why, my question, did this happen or didn't this, in the case of Mercy Otis Warren, why don't more people know about her? In the case of this book, it's, um, well, what about these two women? We have an awful lot of myths about them. Um, and I'd really like to know the truth. So, so it starts a, with a question and ends up that's being- a, That's a perfect jumping off point. Let me welcome people. I'm Lee Wright, the founder of History Camp. I'm outside of Boston and with me from Virginia is? Hi, I'm Carrie Lenz, the director of The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these History Camp discussions to you every week. Tonight, we are excited to have with us Nancy Rubin Stewart. Nancy is an award-winning writer whose eight books focus upon women and social history. She is a recipient of fellowships at the McDowell Colony and at the American Antiquarian Society. She has won a Best Book Award from USA Today and an Author of the Year Award from the American Society of Journalists and Authors. Nancy's journalistic work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, the New England Quarterly, and National Magazine. She is the Executive Director of the Cape Cod Writers' Center. Tonight we'll be discussing her book, Defiant Brides, the untold story of two revolutionary era women who married radical men. Thank you so much for joining us, Nancy. Nancy, we're delighted you're here. And I'm gonna add just one quick note before we start in with the questions. Folks who are watching tonight and who have, are, are passionate about learning more about the Revolutionary War should join us on July 10th for History Camp America. We're gonna talk a little bit about that at the end of the program, but it's July 10th, History Camp America. It's an all day event. We've got lots of great sessions about the Revolutionary War and lots of other aspects of history, uh, historycamp.org. So Nancy, um, I, I think many people have, have heard something or thought something about Peggy, perhaps something not very charitable, uh, and, and perhaps know a little bit about Lucy. Um, we're gonna go much deeper, but at a, at a starting out point, um, what would people, um, what uh, what would have been uh, surprising um, that uh, that that people perhaps don't know? And it looks like there we, we go. Have lost Nancy. Hold on, I'm trying to get in touch with her. So okay, Lee, why don't you tell us more about history camp? I will. Here? I will. Well, this is the first time this has ever happened, by the way, and it's a we're really excited to have. Nancy, because it's such an interesting book, two interesting ladies. Um, but but we'll take this chance to just talk for a couple of minutes about History Camp America. So I mentioned that there are several sessions that relate to the Revolutionary War, assuming that people are watching tonight are especially interested in the Revolutionary War. One of those sessions is uh, starts off the day at Buckman Tavern in Lexington Green, a behind the scenes tour. Uh, we have uh, also, here we go, Nancy, you're back, okay. You know, there's a storm somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so so let me let me tell you. I'm not sure if you heard my question, but it is. You know, many people I think have have heard of and perhaps thought something about Peggy. Um, many people perhaps uh, heard of Lucy. What did what surprised you in your research when you focused and, and dug deep, went through original correspondence and so forth? Well, the most exciting thing was finding out that they, who they were. I was so lucky, which is why I did this book because it's very rare to have uh, late um, 18th century women correspondence. It's, it's rare. And here were two women who had it. So to hear their voices was very exciting. And, you know, I was able to get beyond the myths and, and find out all the sort of nuance of how they, how they were and why they were and what they thought and what they didn't think. And that was exciting. So that was, that was the, um, that's what really excited me. That's what really thrilled me. And that's what really in inspired me to, to write the book. Well, so let's, let's explore this in detail. Um, let's start with, with the, 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 the backgrounds 
of, of each of these ladies, um, each of whose husband is perhaps better known in history, um, but both of whom who were uh, well known in their day. Um, should we start with Peggy? Sure. Well, Peggy was the privileged daughter of uh, Judge Edward Shippen. Uh, he was a prominent uh, uh, person for several generations, the Shippens in uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Um, and she was born in, in 1750. She was the youngest of four children and she was Judge Shippen's uh, favorite. Uh, she was very pretty. Some said the most beautiful woman in America. Um, she was uh, smart and even though women were confined, uh, there she is, <laughs> a portrait of her by John Andre. Even though she was smart she and she learned what, what bells, what Philadelphia bells learned, dancing, a little French, um, drawing, um, things like that, um, needlework. Uh, her father also took her in hand and taught her a lot of things about finance and politics. And uh, she was uh, this sweet young thing. Um, <clears throat> at least that's one of the, one of the uh, certainly she was 18 when she married uh, Benedict Arnold. So she was certainly a young woman um, and somewhat innocent. Uh, so we want to hear about Lucy again, her background, but just a, a, a let's, let's question there about uh, age of being married. Um, from your research, how common was it to be married uh, at, at 18 as a, as a young, young woman? It's a little young. Uh, most colonial women got married, say, 20, 22, generally, um, but it wasn't unheard of. And uh, both of them were 18. Actually, Peggy was just not quite 18 when she married Benedict Arnold. Lucy um, was also just barely 18 at the time. Uh, but it happened and uh, it was not uncommon. So. Okay, so tell us about Lucy. Well, Lucy was the daughter, again, two privileged women and, and she was also privileged. She grew up in Boston. Her father was the provincial secretary uh, for the British government here. And uh, Thomas Flucker was very powerful, and obviously uh, on on the on the British side. Her mother was um, Hannah Waldo, and the Waldos were heirs to a, a vast tract of 500,000 acres plus uh, in Maine um, through a gift of, of uh, one of the monarchs. Um, so, and she grew up in a lovely townhouse in Boston, not too far from Summer Street, for those who know it. And she was. Uh, intelligent. She was, um, this is the only portrait we have of her, a silhouette, I should say, and this is somewhat later, but she was supposed to have been dark haired and um, with flashing um, black eyes, um, sort of high colored and uh, maybe a little rotund, but, but you know, voluptuous uh, young woman and, and very spirited. So talk just a little bit about courtship in that age. Uh, we, we know that uh, Henry Knox was a bookseller Hmm. And um, and uh, not uh, there was certainly nothing about Knox at that point that would suggest that he would go on to play such a pivotal role. But let's talk a little bit about how the two met and that courtship, and then the same with Peggy and uh, Benedict, Benedict Arnold. Sure. Um, well, uh, Henry Knox uh, had his father had been a, a really somewhat well-to-do owner of a ship, but he his father died when he when Henry was twelve and he had to leave Boston Latin School, but he loved learning. So first he briefly apprenticed to a printer, but then he eventually opened a bookstore and called the New London Bookstore. It was very popular in Boston. John Adams was among many of the people, Nathaniel Green uh, and many other who, names we know now went there. But he was poor and he was, because he was a tradesman, he was not in the same social class as the Flockles, that is Lucy's parents. Uh, and they just turned their nose up at him. Moreover, a man with great inquisitive powers, uh, he was fascinated with and began to believe as the, as the oppression, the press of acts of the British government heated up, he <clears throat> became more and more convinced that indeed uh, there should be a revolution. And that of course, <laughs> that was of course contradictory to what the Fluckers were, were, were supported by and Lucy too. By the British government to, to live, live, you know, in great wealth. So, <laughs> mean, given given the different social circles, social circles and also political. Uh, but she defied them, and she did get married to him in seventeen seventy in June seventeen seventy four. 
uh, actually at King's Chapel in Boston. And her parents didn't come to the wedding. Only her sister did. Um, so. More to be said about that, but I want to go on to Peggy. Yeah. Um, by the time Peggy, Peggy was, uh, when the British occupied Philadelphia, Peggy, um, Peggy enjoyed all the flirtations and all the uh, favors from the, the British, the handsome British officers. I have to say her father, we know, still don't know, was he a neutralist? Was he, he, he switched back and forth when the when the um, British were in, in Philadelphia, he uh, courted them and would have them to his house and was friendly with them. When uh, that was over later, he uh, was back with the Patriots. And we know he just wanted to keep his judgeships, which of course he lost off and on for a while in the turmoil that went on at that time. So that all, all that being said, so Peggy too, was 16, 17 year old, the famous, um, well, a famous festival when General Howe was going to leave, Michanza, I mean, I'm not pronouncing it right, but it's Italian. And uh, she participated in it. And that picture that you, sh you showed earlier, maybe we can get back to it, is a picture that uh, one of her uh, British officer friends uh, painted of her, or a sketched of her uh, going to that, that uh, gala event. So, but Peggy was 17, 18, 17, and... Benedict Arnold uh, was at that time still a hero. He had been the, uh, there's Peggy uh, in this Machanza, Misanja outfit uh, um, at the time. And she was supposed to be the most handsome woman in America, according to the British officers. She was, she was China doll gorgeous, blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, anyway, back to um, Benedict Arnold was a hero, and he had been injured uh, actually twice, uh, refused to have his leg amputated. So he has one leg was shorter than the other from what had happened with his bones. But he had been the eagle um, uh, of Saratoga. He was here, he is. He was the hero. He did a, uh, or uh, he was a hero at uh, Freeman Farms. He really was largely responsible for the defeat at Saratoga, although. Ratio Gates with the credit. So Washington, to um, honor him, uh, gave him this job when finally the British left Philadelphia um, to uh, become the, quotes, commandant of Philadelphia, which is really the peacekeeping governor, because the citizens were in turmoil. I mean, first they were, first they were patriots, then they were occupied by the British for nine months, which was changed everything. Then they were back to being patriots and not, and not well to do because the patriots, of course, everything was, you know, money was very tight given all that was going on with financing of the war. Nevertheless, he was a glamorous character. He was a hero. Um, he was the uh, peacekeeper governor, if you will, of Philadelphia. And uh, Peggy met him um, through a friend, at, uh, one of the many balls that he gave. And uh, he courted her assiduously. Judge Shippen was no fool. He said, hmm, what do I know about this guy? And he contacted some of his friends in, in um, Connecticut where Arnold was from. And he found out a few things that he didn't think Arnold was really, you know, Arnold had been an apothecary and a trader and he actually traded a lot in, in um, the West Indies. But there were a few things, few shady stories about him that really worried uh, uh, Judge Shippen very much and, and his wife. Although we don't hear too much about his wife, because in those days, women didn't, weren't really allowed to talk too much or express their opinions in public. So, uh, long story short, Peggy insisted, and I just back up for a minute, as a child and thereafter, and there are many accounts of this, she didn't get her way, she threw tantrums and she refused to eat. She'd go on hunger strike, she'd get sick and everything else. So they gave in and she married him. Uh, in April of 1779. Um, by that time, Arnold was already in trouble uh, because of certain, quotes, irregularities, let's put it that way, uh, shifty business, uh, lots of corruption, it, all to his own benefit. Um, and uh, he already was uh, not too pleased uh, with the American patriots. Well, we can get into that <laughs> later if you wish. But uh, anyway, she married him in April of 79. Two, um, two myths about Peggy at that point. First is that she was a sweet young thing 
who was obviously bowled over by him. He was 18 years older than she was, 36 years of age. Um, and, you know, he had been married before his wife had deceased. He had uh, three children by a former marriage. And um, she was madly in love with him. So when he became unhappy with the Americans, he wasn't getting repaid for the money he spent to, to finance regiments that went up not only to Saratoga, but earlier battles in the revolution. He, uh, and he wasn't made a major general. Some younger men were first, and that infuriated him. Uh, so he had a lot of gripes. And he wasn't an easy person to start with. So uh, anyway, myth one is she's this sweet young thing, and she just goes along with him. But she's unhappy, and he's going he's gonna to betray uh, the patriots, and he's going to get paid for, for saving America by siding with the British. And he's going to make a lot of money. So maybe, maybe that's what she did as a, as a good wife. Uh, the other myth, which pervades today to this very day, there have been movies, there have been novels, <laughs> who knows what about, about this, is that she was the sexual seductress, that during the honeymoon, she was the one who convinced him that he, because her father, John Shippen, was probably on the British side and he was more secure, that, that, that Arnold, you know, really should look to the British and forget all this patriot stuff. It really didn't matter. It was a silly idea anyway to defy the British, that she's, she was the person, the instigator for his treachery. Those are the two myths. But well, so let, let's talk a little bit about what you found through your original research. And I believe you had the benefit of, of uh, a lot of correspondence, a lot of things that she'd written. Is that correct? Well, with Peggy, that's not exactly so. Um, people wrote letters. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have computers. Uh, they didn't even have typewriters. But uh, her family, so worried about her reputation later, destroyed and burned. Once, once, once Benedict Donald was found to be a traitor, when that happened, then they burned all her letters. We don't even begin to hear her voice until after the uh, British uh, Treaty with America in 1783. So we don't know. So where, what, what sources did you have that gave you more insight into, into Peggy and, and helped uh, dis perhaps dispel those myths? Uh, well, there are um, many other accounts uh, in which she is either named or implicated that are they, look, they are historically accurate. Um, and later, when I do hear her voice or read her voice, you can see this is a very, very intelligent, sophisticated, strong woman um, with firm ideas uh, about life and people. So this was not a sweet, innocent, you know, person who was just run over by this older man. Um, so that was, that becomes pretty helpful in figuring out that she had at least, if not an instigator, she certainly was an, an accomplice. In fact, she's even paid by the British government later with a pension from Queen Charlotte as the accomplice or somebody who helped. Um, Arnold. Well, and, and let's let's talk then a little more about about Lucy, um, and and perhaps some of the myths, and then what you found to be perhaps closer to the truth. Well, Lucy comes off in American history. Uh, what, they're both iconic figures, both both Peggy and, and and Lucy. Needless to say, but Lucy comes off as this iconic, perfect wife uh, uh, for uh, a general who becomes General Henry Knox. And indeed, she does follow Henry through all the army camps, uh, often is thrown out, by the way, when things are going to get rough with a, with a battle um, by, by Henry. But uh, she does uh, faithfully traipse after him. She does have, she has 13 children. Um, she bears 13 children, ultimately only three. It's, it's really sad. His, his, uh, Henry Knox, a famous painting, which, by the way, is at the Boston uh, um, Museum of Fine Arts. Um, but um, she, she adores Henry, the, the fabulous love letter she writes to him, and we do have those letters. Uh, and it, it was wonderful to be able to get them. Uh, fortunately, many of them were digitized at the Gilder Lerman um, uh, collection in New York. Uh, although the Massachusetts Historical Society has, of course, all the original letters. 
So we, this is great love affair between them. And she, uh, because of her former high status in society, she is, is sort of the self-appointed um, social doyen of, of affairs and festivals and celebrations and so on. And so we see her at the inauguration, for instance, of George Washington. We see her many times before that in army camps where there were celebrations after treaties with the French and so on were signed. Um, so there's this wonderful view of her on one side. When you start reading the letters and Henry's responses to them, and you understand this is history in the context of some of that. I mean, she's writing, she's quite demanding and um, she's a prickly personality um, and she uh, fusses and fumes a lot. And Henry is forever trying to, <laughs> trying to make up to her about that. Uh, but of course he's in the middle of a, of a, of a war. So uh, he has to be firm at times with her. So there's that side to her. Um, that is not that attractive. And she also later on, and a lot of theories about this, not sure, um, but she becomes sort of obsessively compulsive about uh, people have to be a certain, dress a certain way, be a certain way, and mostly play cards with her. I mean, people can't go visit her if they aren't gonna play cards and she must win. So this becomes a bit of a joke. And there's some other comments in, some stories, some are malicious, some are probably real uh, about her sort of, um, well, her difficult uh, personality and uh, autocratic in some ways. So we see this as, as time goes on. But on, on the other hand, this is quite a woman that followed him through all these army camps. And by the way, when she married Henry and the revolution began, she never saw her parents again. And remind us, so um, again, the, the, the date of marriage of Lucy and Henry was when? Uh, it was in 1774, June. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So this was, so she married a book, uh, a bookseller. Yes, yeah, she did. A rebel bookseller. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A tradesman. <laughs> um, that's, that's so interesting. You know, we know, of course, of, of, of Henry Knox and, and his, his uh, you know his great feats, especially with uh, bringing the cannon down from, from Fort Ticonderoga and later being a general and so on and so forth. Uh, but given that, given her status in society, uh, that that was all the common unknown at that point, right? Uh, it was she again was marrying a tradesman. Um, so why don't we pick up on that point about following Henry through the camps and so forth? Um, what was it like for for her for other wives perhaps um we know a little bit about martha coming to visit occasionally and so forth how many other wives were there what give us kind of bring that bring that to life for yes people. there were uh any number of other wives that came mostly the wives of course of officers what is not mentioned of course are the camp followers which uh um, you know they did the cooking and the nursing as well as perhaps some sexual favors for some of the soldiers but i want to talk about the wives that we know about. And there are quite a few of them, including Nathaniel Green's wife, um, and who loved to flirt, by the way, with the officers. But um, Martha came twice, she came in the spring. Uh, she did not, and she stayed through, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but she, she certainly left before the fall and winter. The winter, of course, every, everything slowed down. Basically, there were no campaigns in the winter because of the weather. Um, but she, um, and she was, you know, very gracious and so on. We don't know, I don't know a lot about that, but I do know that Lucy did sometimes stay in some pretty miserable situations. One myth is about her at Valley Forge, uh, where she actually goes with Benedict Arnold, this is before he's, when he's still a hero, uh, because he wants to meet with Washington and he wants, he wants Congress to give him money. So, um, they go and Valley Forge, though, in the spring, despite the myth of everybody, how terrible it was, which it was earlier, by the spring, the wagons and supplies were coming through and there was plenty to eat. And there were, so she, she lived there for a while with him. But there are some other situations where it's, it's frightening. Um, although almost always, because uh, by the time Henry is, is made chief of artillery pretty early because he's so brilliant. He, He's read all these books that he used to have in his bookstore on military equipment, and he knows he's read them, he's studied them, he's memorized them. 
So he's, he creates all these ingenious uh, military gear and, and things that really were responsible for helping to win the revolution. But um, she, so he has a reasonably high position and pretty much, not always, but pretty much as the war goes on, she lives in, in better situations. But in the beginning, it's really pitiful uh, because when Washington comes to Boston in the beginning with that raw colonial army, um, she has to be away from Boston, which is occupied, of course, by the British. And she's sent to Watertown to a safe house uh, for a while. And uh, she, don't forget now, her, she's alienated from a family who are, you know, still in Boston. They don't even write to her. And uh, she's all alone. And, um, and, you know, she's a bit of a snob. So she's with all kinds of women and all kinds of people. And I don't think she liked it too much. But uh, it was not, you know, food wasn't plentiful. It was cold. It was uncomfortable. She had to probably share a bed or certainly many, many rooms. Everybody was crowded in. And uh, she becomes pregnant when she had been with Henry. And Henry is then sent uh, to Ticonderoga. Now it's winter time. All right, we're into December and January and uh, 75, 76. And um, she, um, she's hysterical that he had to go to, to, you know, northern New York state, well, it wasn't the state, but northern New York, and he may not come back. I mean, the roads were terrible. The British were certainly out there. Uh, he could have easily been killed. And he said, he said, only be three weeks. Yeah. And of course it ended up being something like 60 something days. And um, she she's alone and she's pregnant. And uh, she does eventually, she eventually gets to Worcester. She's sent to Worcester. Uh, better, I guess, than Watertown, wherever, whatever that was about. And, uh, but he does come back, of course, with the, uh, all the cannons in the mortar and the famous uh, scene about that. And uh, um, soon um, she does deliver the first, her first child. So, you know, things aren't always easy. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned that she had, uh, she bore a total of 13 children, only three of whom survived. Yes. Uh, so uh, just a reminder of how difficult. Uh, well, uh, uh, some of them died in the army camp. At one point in, um, uh, she's in New Jersey. She's in various places in New Jersey, Middlebrook and other places. Um, she becomes, she becomes ill. Uh, her child becomes ill and dies. Uh, there are a few stillborns. There are some children who live for a few years. Um, some are sent to, to school, um, and even a, one to boarding school. Um, but, you know, they move around so much over those, those years. Uh, that, and then even after the, even after the truce and the treaty, uh, there's a lot of movement around for Henry because he becomes a major general and, uh, and so on, and he becomes eventually the Secretary of War. So there's still a lot of moving around, and um, some of her children are born frail. And you have to wonder, you know, the hardships that she did have. Can you imagine traveling in these carriages on, on these roads that are, if you want to call them roads, um, pregnant or think about us, you know, you get a cold, you go to bed, you maybe take a Tylenol or, if you get really sick, you take an antibiotic and then have that. Um, so, you know, there's there's all of that, and you wonder what what that toll took on her. Well, let's let's go back to let's go back to Peggy. Uh, so it so it sounds like your assessment is that um, uh, that, that she did have knowledge of uh, her husband's plans, uh, and that that there was there was that active communication. Is that Am I saying that correctly? Well, it's more than knowledge. Uh, Benedict Arnold also had to do a great deal of traveling around. One of the things he was attempting to do finally, having connected with the British and through spies and so on, um, connected with John Andre, we'll get to him, I guess, um, uh, who was the uh, ultimate spy person close, close to Clinton. But um, he had to travel around a lot and Peggy, would be the one to deliver messages through her contacts to um, the British in in uh, New York City, British-occupied New York City. 
I mean, it's proven. That's that's a known fact. Um, and then, well, it wasn't known so much early on until the Supreme Executive Council, when he came back later, uh, found some evidence and found some of her scurrilous comments. I mean, she portrayed herself as this sweet, sweet-tempered person uh, externally, but that wasn't really quite the case. So she, it's, she is, is finally sent to Arnold um, in British occupied New York with her infant son. It's this very sad scene where Judge Shippen has to take her uh, from um, Philadelphia to the shores of, of, uh, of uh, the Hudson and watch her sail across to New York City and never see her again, her and her, her, his grandchild. Yeah. And, and, and talk to us about uh, how she was treated after uh, Arnold defected. Well, at the moment, do you mean at the moment in at the Hudson? And, and as, as people found out and so forth. Oh, well, uh, when, when, he, when it was found that he had fled to the British um, on that uh, warship, the Vulture and the Hudson, um, Washington had arrived at their, the home they were living in on the Hudson and she pretended that she was shocked and she knew nothing about this and he had betrayed her and he betrayed America and she had no idea. And her only defense was she went mad. And so she, she does this, this thing for three days where she's screaming and yelling and pulling her hair out. And, she's, and they all believe her, um, Washington and, and Knox and Lafayette and, and uh, Hamilton and the poor thing. They sent her back in the carriage to Philadelphia. But on the way back, the citizens are furious. They're quite sure she somehow is involved with it. It's her husband. And, uh, you know, many places won't allow them to stay overnight. Um, and once she's back in Philadelphia, she retreats, you know, into the family circle and her home. But pretty soon there are parades against and um, um, rallies and riots uh, about Arnold and burnings of him in effigy dummies and, uh, and about her. And she's, um, she's uh, protected by her family, but she's terrified to go out and doesn't. And, and Fane's illness, and, and probably was absolutely traumatized at the reaction. So the Arnold's old rival, um, Joseph Reed in Philadelphia, uh, very powerful at the Supreme Executive Council, they, they dig up these letters from Peggy um, that show her to be certainly not sympathetic to um, the American cause and other things. So um, then they, they exile her, and uh, a Judge Shippen tries his best to to get them to plead and say she's young. I mean, by that time she's 22, I think, 21 or 22 years of age, and uh, it won't work. And at that point, she is sent, as I said before, with her father to the shores of the Hudson and then to New York City, and the British. Um, uh, take her in. I mean, she's charming. She's beautiful. She's uh, amiable. She's personal. Um, and uh, but Arnold has now betrayed. Not only betrayed America once. He now is actually fighting on the other side. He's a, he has a, a position as a um, well. He's he's uh, a brigadier general of um, the provincial troops in America, and. Uh, He's traveling and she sort of comes out on her own. I mean, she's charming and she captivates everybody as she had been a bell in Philadelphia. Now she's a bell in New York. But when they go to, when they go to England, she again is regaled and a wonderful comment from somebody saying that, uh, let's see if I can find that for you. It's a perfectly wonderful woman. Um, and were her husband dead, she would be, you know, enjoying all of us and with us. So, you know, he, the British don't like somebody without character, uh, even if it's somebody on their own side. And, uh, you know, his, his life after that is never, he never attains the, the uh, glory he thought he was going to get, um, to say the least, let alone the money. And, but she, um, she is charming and, and she seems to be really the one who sort of paves the way for things, whatever happens over the next 20 years to go on. Um, yeah, so she's treated well 
Um, and with respect, as I said earlier, Queen Charlotte gives her a pension. Uh, it's quite a, quite a large sum um, for the rest of her life for her aid to Arnold. And, and uh, it's how old was she when she passed away? Pardon me? How old was Peggy when she passed away? It's sad. She's um, 46. Um, no, yes, she's 44. She dies of probably uh, uterine cancer. Mm. Yeah. Um, but um, Arnold dies before her. He dies in uh, 1801. And she he's left her in debt, which she knew about. And she had been saving her pension. And she'd been investing it in American money <laughs> through her father, <laughs> Judge Shippen, uh, and back and forth with all kinds of correspondence about that. And she is determined that she's going to honor his name and she auctions off their fine house and their furniture and everything else. And she's determined to have her children go to the best schools and she manages that. This is kind of her dying wish. And she's the one who really ends up being incredibly strong. How oh, interesting. And, and, and tell us then about, about Lucy uh, later in life. Yeah, um, well, uh, Lucy had been, um, her, her mother had been heir to the Waldo Patent, uh, P-A-T-E-N-T, uh, 500,000 acres in Maine. And the rest of the family, of course, were entitled to that. But, but of course, they were Tories. And so most of them, almost everybody went to England. Um, and there's a lot of correspondence that does then go back and forth uh, with Lucy. And, and Arnold uh, and um, Henry um, travels to Maine. And he, um, he manages to get, because the land is ceded, I mean, it's not legal. They can't inherit it in England. They're, they've left the country and they disinherited as American soil citizens, I guess when say Americans. Um, and so it's sort of there for grabs and he grabs it. First, he tries to divide some of it up with some of the family members in England, but this wasn't really gonna go too well again because they're over there. And he eventually gets the entire patent and eventually, much later, after he's Secretary of War for many years, and they keep moving, they continue to move, and it's, it's really, as I say, this couldn't have been an easy thing, even, even with help, which they had at that point. Um, so eventually, when he retires, they move to um, um, Maine, to Thomaston, Maine, at Penobscot Bay, and um, he build, they build this, um, this mansion, um, which they call Montpelier, which is it's got some neoclassical aspects to it. It's a fascinating house. It's quite elegant and quite out of place for Maine, frankly. Um, and he's kind of the gentleman, I won't say farmer, but of course it were farmland and so on. But they, they live quite aristocratically in a staff of servants and they're good to the people in the town, but there's a lot of um, people on those tracks that have been settlers for years. And there's a lot of uh, ugly stories, unfortunately. Um, about his uh, treatment of some of them, which is a whole other thing. And Lucy is rather autocratic with her her demands of the way people have to do things. Um, but they are continually entertaining. I mean, there's something like 100 beds at one point. I don't know. Um, but they, they entertain or have 10 or 12 people stay over every, every night. And this is consecutive throughout the entire, uh, up until the winter. Um, so they live quite well, um, but, and she has three surviving children. The son is sort of a disaster. The two daughters are, are pretty good. Um, and one of the daughters gets married and has grandchildren. And um, this is uh, delightful for the, for the Knoxes. And they are surrounded by uh, friends. They have a big uh, stable, many, many things. Um, then Henry, uh, in 1806, um, during a dinner, he swallows a chicken bone. And um, uh, 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 within a few days, he, he dies. Um, the story went later that the chicken bone, you know, went through his system and cut, you know, cut into his intestines and infection and he died. And um, you know, Lucy is beside herself. She, she is just distraught. And, uh, but she does continue to live on until 1824. 
um, and uh, her children, her daughter, her two daughters, uh, somewhat of a comfort to her. But, you know, they can't afford this huge house and it, it does fall into disrepair. Eventually it's torn down, um, but um, much more in the, or I don't know, in the, in the, somewhere in the 20th century, late 20th century, it was, they found the plans and they've rebuilt it and it's wonderful. And I really urge anybody who's watching to, to go there. Um, and, and toward, it's fantastic to see it. Well, I was just going to say that uh, that house is open to, uh, to, to visit. Yes. I didn't realize it was um, not the original house. No, but it looks it. It looks like it. Very good. Very good. Uh, and, 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 and fascinating, just imagining the number of house guests uh, <laughs> night, night after night. Yeah. Um, well, this, is, this has been so interesting. Um, Carrie, do you want to join us? Do we have uh, questions from folks who've been watching? Hi there. Oh, let me see that there. All right. So in your book, you write that Lucy was the Emily Post of her day. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about that? Sure, because she grew up in this high society British style here in Boston. And her father was the provincial secretary of the, of, of the area. Uh, and so she, she understands all the niceties and the formalities and all of the customs and the way things should be done. So despite the poverty and the traumas of army camps when there are celebrations, she's the one who will um, tell them, well, if you're going to have a celebration, for instance, to celebrate the truce with France and the, and the money, that she will tell them how the things should be done and what, you know, certain things should be done. And they all, they all listen to her. And, she goes on to do this right up through the inauguration uh, and afterwards for many, many celebrations and, and people listen to it. So she is kind of the Emily poster, the Miss Manners of her day. All right, wonderful. Now, in early in the war when she was in Watertown and she was kind of in with a lot of people in crowded places and so forth, that was a little challenging. Did she find camaraderie with other generals' wives and so forth as she spent more time in the camps? I wish I knew more about it because one of the comments in one of the books, and it's true, <clears throat> when you go back and you look at the, the correspondences, she only writes to Henry. <laughs> so she only writes to Henry and all these letters are only to Henry. Um, and mostly it's about her relationship with Henry Right. He didn't this, she didn't do that. He, you know, she had her smallpox inoculation, so on and so forth. Um, but no, not an awful lot. Um, I don't, I don't hear about super close friends. Martha Washington loved her. Uh, she met Martha when she was probably 19 and pregnant with her first child um, and really took her in. And actually she does stay with Martha late in the war during the Battle of Yorktown. Um, and we hear, you know, a little bit about that. Martha's, you know, very discreet. Um, so we don't, we don't hear huge amounts of gossip about her. But uh, as far as other women, I mean, we know about Nathaniel Green's wife. Um, and, um, but mostly it's in passing, if that. Again, it's mostly about Henry. She's just, this is, this is, this is her life. Is Henry. If I could ask just a, a, quite a follow up on that, Carrie. Uh, so I understand uh, Lucy's dealing with children and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, Henry's trying to win the war with Washington and others. D does, he, does he reply to every letter? Does he reply at length? Uh, does he have the time? What, how, does that, how does that all work? No, it, it, there's a lot of contention. And, when, and sometimes letters will miscarry, of course by horseback or roads or storms or wars, battles, whatever. But there's a lot of contention when she doesn't hear from him or they have fights, you know, they have fights. He says, I didn't say that. I didn't mean that or vice versa. Or she'll say that she doesn't, it isn't always one way. Um, and sometimes it's a, a long delay before the, the letters, you know, get to each other. And so it's sort of a fight and slow action or, um, or not, or a love affair, and so, but their love letters are really, I want to emphasize their love more than I do contention because 
that is, they're just crazy about each other right up to the moment he dies and after. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's it's really and I, and I just want to say um, Peggy's trajectory is a little different. In the beginning, she says that Arnold is the best of husbands, quote unquote, and much later when uh, a relative, much later, a young relative gets married, she and the, her sister writes to her and wonders about that. And she says, well, she says, well, marriage is but a lottery. So, yeah. And we don't hear the best of husband anymore in any of her letters towards the end. So, right. So, yeah. Well, she was definitely put into some challenging spots. She was. And, you know, one of the big questions in the book it looks in the beginning like, well, we should just, you know, adore Lucy, okay? And we should really just hate, you know, this treasonous Peggy. And, but when you when you go in into depth and look at them, I, you may have to come up with a different kind of a view. I'll just right. leave it at that. All right, that is a great place to end. Thank you, this has been fantastic. So we do have a link to Nancy's book in the chat and it's a good read. So you can go and learn more about these women and their husbands and the interesting times that they lived in. Um, we also have a link to Nancy's website where you can find out more about her other work and she's written a lot. So there's some good stuff there for you too. And just a little, uh, something to keep in, in mind. She has a new book coming out about Benjamin Franklin and the women in his life. So that will be in winter and we look forward to having you back to talk about that as well. All right, uh, as you heard early in the broadcast, History Kids of America is next week. Excited about it, we are getting excited, getting geared up and it's gonna be a fun time. If you have register yet don't wait too long the last day to register is july 8th so do it now you can do that at historycamp.org slash register thank and you so next much next week for history camp discussion. i just Absolutely. want to say thank you we're so glad you joined us. thank you thank you My next pleasure. week we will be talking about We'll be talking with Harold Knutson, and he is going to join us to talk about Civil War General James Longstreet and his impact on military strategy. He, that is something he was very gifted at, and he uh, put into play some strategies that affected the military all the way through World War II. So we will have a good discussion with him next week, and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. And have a good night. Let me just get one note here. Yes. So this is the schedule for <laughs> History Camp America. I'm just looking at it. I'm just do people realize all of the great stuff, right? All those sessions, 35 plus sessions, seven behind the scenes tours. So you, get, you have to join us. History Camp, HistoryCamp.org. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Nancy, Carrie. Good night. My pleasure.